Zangu Ye Kie, Nanadihad Kristen, Nadaibo, Nadadiai Haley Public Library, Zandainu Sungaka. So I just said, good evening. My name is Kristen. I am a Euro American. I'm a Daibo. I work at the Haley Public Library. And everything is good. Zandainu Sangaka. Everything is good. So I'm going to invite you folks to learn a little Shoshone. So we're going to learn good evening. So Zangu. Ye Yeka. Zangu Ye Yeka. Zangu Ye Yeka. Zandai Sangaka. Zan. Dai Yu Sun Gaka. Zan. Dai Yu Sun Gaka. Everything is good. Everything is fine. So thank you. So I wanted to start um, with a, a big, broad look at Native America. Um, these are the general territorial boundaries of the Native peoples in um, North America. Uh, you can see the circled ones. Um, are the Shoshone people the, as a large group. Um, and uh, you can see how in some cases cultures overlap a great deal, but in other places cultures really have hard, fast borders. Um, I think you can see from that picture why it, how it would be so easy to have trade routes and exchange cultures and information and food sources and resources. Um, so that's what North America looked like before Columbus came. Um, and I just thought that was a great way to start this. Um, you can go to Native Land Digital. Um, it's actually an interactive uh, website, so you can put your cursor on it, and you can spin around and see the native tribes in South America, you can see them in Africa, you can see them in Australia, and New Zealand, um, you can see them around the world. It's a, it's a fabulous resource. But I want to speak specifically of the Shoshone culture. Um, and we'll start with language, because that's where we started tonight. Um, Shoshone is part of the Uto Aztecan language family. Um, that language family has 61 languages in it. Um, so all the, the marks that you see ranging from Central America all the way up to Baja, uh, into Southern California, and then spreading out into the Great Basin, those are all Uto Aztecan languages. Um, each of the different segments and colors that you see are individual languages. So the languages, um, the language of Shoshone um, originated, let's see if I can get the right button here, um, right in this area here in Southern California. Um, there's some debate how that language started. Um, there was an earlier belief that through trade and um, uh, various kinds of exchanges, it just moved its way up here. Um, but, but there's a more recent theory that um, a group of people were here for quite a long time and then as the um, environmental uh, conditions changed, then these people moved and spread into the Great Basin. And you'll see that there are four major groups of that language, um, that aspect of the language family. It's called the um, Numic language. And so you have the, the northern Paiute on the far left, um, the Sosoni language in the center, um, the Colorado River Numic, and then Comanche. And Comanche speak a language that's very, very similar to Sosoni. Um, they split from the main group of Shoshone people in the 1700s. Nobody really knows why. There's a rumor that there was a, a familial or band dispute 
and one group decided to make their own way someplace else. Um, but Comanche and um, Sosoni is, uh, they're, they're mutually intelligible, um, but there's not a free exchange of language. So where do these folks live? Or where did they live? Where do they live? Um, what kind of climate did they live in? What, what were they facing when they lived here? Or, sorry, when, um, uh, when they moved into this area. So all of the red, dark orange, and light orange in that area um, is 15 inches of precipitation or less. So the people who moved up from Southern California and expanded into the Great Basin were very skilled at living in a very dry uh, environment. Now that environment fluctuated, so you can, you can easily find maps um, that show a lot of palayas or seasonal um, ponds, um, especially through um, Nevada, but also into southern, uh, sorry, uh, western uh, Utah and into a little bit of Idaho. So those um, seasonal palayas would fill up with water, ducks and geese would land, sometimes there were little crustaceans, little shrimp that it would emerge from the, um, from the mud they could endure from one season to the next. And so they became a very important food source. Um, but it allowed the, the people as they were moving north and exploring this new terrain um, uh, opportunities uh, to find food for themselves. So there were eight original tribes living in, um, in what we call Idaho now. Um, the Kootenai, the Kalispell, Coeur d'Alene, uh, the Palouse, the Nez Perce, Shoshone, Bannock, and the Northern Paiute. Um, so you can see from this map, uh, with the exception of maybe the Coeur d'Alene up there in the Panhandle, um, the part of Idaho that they used was only a part of their, their territory. Um, so they expanded much beyond those boundaries. And I just wanted to point out some of the traditional resource routes um, that the Shoshone people used. Um, down at the bottom, you'll see uh, there's a pine nut resource uh, that was very, very important. Um, pronghorn antelope here and here in the big, um, in the big plains. Um, they would go uh, west into the Camas Prairie and beyond um, for Camas. Um, there were salmon all the way along the, salmon, uh, the Snake River. Um, they were only stopped by Shoshone Falls. Um, so there were, that was an important place for them to go and find a food, re, a really important food resource. Um, and then, uh, of course, they would travel um, north into Montana um, to get um, buffalo, bison. Um, they would also travel over here where it says traditional resource routes um, to the Great Plains to get um, buffalo as well. Um, they would also travel up into central Idaho to get bighorn sheep. Um, they uh, migrated seasonally, um, and so they would go, they would travel to find the richest resources of that particular part of the season. Um, and as they would go along, they would uh, utilize sort of lesser abundant resources. So sometimes the more of the plant resources were kind of the bread and butter. You know, so. so currently there are um, five federally recognized tribal nations and reservations, that's a, a legal term, in Idaho. Um, nationwide there are 574 um, that are federally recognized and then an additional 63 uh, that are recognized just by the state. Um, and I don't know how many beyond that um, that are seeking federal recognition. Um, some tribes were considered exterminated, um, but it turned out some people were, were still maintaining those cultural uh, ways and they're, they're seeking redress and recognition of their, their, um, their tribe. So, probably many of us um, hike trails or drive along on the roads and um, think about what a beautiful place this is. But let me ask you, how, what do you need to, to live any place? 
You know, if you've, if you've taken a biology class or something like that, they usually say there's four things that you have to have. So what would one of those four things be? Wi-Fi. <laughs> Wi-Fi. <laughs> Water. What else? Food. Shelter. Space. Mm -hmm. So it kind of a territory. So really, whether you're an amoeba or whether you're a mountain sheep, you still need those things. You still need some kind of food. You still need some sort of water. You still need some kind of protection or shelter. And then you need an area that you feel comfortable and at home in. Very well done. So, um, so I invite you to look at this image and just for a moment, just imagine what resources might be there. <laughs> Down in there someplace? Mm -hmm. So I'm going to pause right here. Um, and I just want to offer um, a land acknowledgement. Um, so before we continue, I would like to recognize that we are gathered this evening on the traditional homeland of the Shoshone and the Bannock peoples. We acknowledge their elders, past and present, and their future elders, and all indigenous people. We offer gratitude to the land and the waters and the original caretakers of it. And I would also like to take just a moment and thank three people who um, uh, were, were our um, mentors and friends of mine. Um, one was Paul Raska. Um, he was an art dealer here. Um, he would describe himself as just a white Polish guy from Buffalo, New York. But he was, ended up being adopted into the Blackfoot tribe. Um, he became a bundle holder. He spoke the language fluently, um, and he was considered a very important um, part of their um, cultural tradition. Um, two other people I would like to thank and, and honor are uh, Drusilla Gould, uh, who is a Shoshone elder, and Dr. Chris Lothar, who um, both started and ran the Shoshone language program at Idaho State University. Um, I was privileged to be able to um, take Shoshone as my, forgive me, foreign language. Um, I can't speak it. Uh, you heard about what I could speak. Um, it's a very complicated language. Um, but I just wanted to take a moment uh, and thank them and honor them um, for their, um, their contribution to uh, the people and the culture uh, of the Shoshone tribe. So. So okay, so I've invited you to imagine what, what food resources might be there. So that's what this, this program tonight is gonna to be looking at. So we're gonna look at a few of the trees, shrubs, and flowering plants that uh, native peoples um, utilized. And I wanted to talk a little bit to begin about names. Um, uh, the Shoshone people didn't refer to themselves as Shoshone people. They referred to themselves as Nua, the people, Nua. Other people call them Shoshone. Um, it turns out, and I didn't know this until I was researching this program, but blue grunt bunch wheatgrass, the Shoshone name for it, which you can see here on the, um, the right-hand side, um, is Sonip. And a variation of the word sonip is sosoni. And the, I know, um, I'm, I'm looking at Mary because she's a lover of grasses, so as is John, uh, John Shelley. So other people call them Shoshone or sosoni because they thatched their um, wiki-ups um, with grasses. And Sonip means, or uh, sorry, Sosoni means high waving grasses. And so that was the name other people gave to the Shoshone uh, folks. Um, 
other name that was given to them was snake because they would be asked, you know, who are, who are your people? And they, they like this. And people thought, oh, they were the snake Indians, of course. But that wasn't it at all. They were salmon eaters. So that was actually the salmon coming up the river. Yeah. So you'll hear these names, you know, uh, in many, many ways. And so I also wanted to point out that I've used the word Sosoni, Shoshone, and Shosoni um, already tonight. Um, of course, the Shoshone language was not written down until I think it started being written down in the mid 1800s, but not really, I mean, a, a word here and a word there. But it wasn't really studied as a language um, until the late 1800s. Um, and people who study languages, linguistics, uh, ling um, that's not the right word. Um, and, but that's not the people. Anyway, linguists. linguists thank you. Yes, um, to trans to figure out what a non-written language is and put it into a written language, they develop sort of a they, they create an alphabet, and that alphabet is called an orthography. So different people have heard these words that were spoken without non-written words. And some heard it as Shoshone, some heard it as Sosoni, some heard it as Shosoni. Um, so, so you'll probably hear all of them coming out of my mouth because I guess I have a mixed up brain. Um, but you'll see that in writing. You know, some, some place you'll see Shoshone, some place you'll see Sosoni, some place you'll see something else. So just, just wanted to make you just aware of, of um, how confusing that can be. So, so we're starting here with uh, Sosoni, high waving grasses. Um, almost all the grasses that you'll find, native grasses around here, were used as food in one way or another. This is Great Basin Wild Rye. Um, all the seeds have come off of it, but um, that's one of the big bunch grasses. Uh, the spikelets were used as medicine, and oftentimes when things are used for medicine, sometimes you don't know if that medicine really means ceremonial purposes, so sometimes you don't, you're, it's hard to find out what the actual use of it is. Um, so all I was able to find out was that the spikelet, so this little guy up here, um, was used for some kind of medicine, but then the seeds themselves were pounded and turned into uh, uh, flour and, and added to things and made a, a bread made out of it. Um, from that resource route map that you saw earlier, you could see that camas was a huge resource for them. Um, it's incredibly nutritious. Um, it's relatively easy to dig. Um, it's absolutely delicious. Um, a friend brought me, I don't know, 10, 15 bulbs that they had harvested. We cleaned them all up, took the husk off, stuck them in a slow oven, roasted them for a couple of hours. And um, I don't know how to describe what, the texture was like a really soft wax, but it was kind of like a cross between a potato and, and a softly cooked rice. But then there's, they caramelize. Um, so they were just wonderful. And you can see why, one, they'd want to eat them because they're delicious. But two, they're also highly nutritious as well. So they became a, and, and plus you could um, process them, um, form them into cakes, dry them, and they lasted, you know, a year or two. So they were good travel food. Um, they were they were good, um, uh, not really emergency ration, but it's something that would last over a year or so. Um, another uh, really important food was the single needle, needle pinion pine, duba. Um, and let's see, I've got some. So these are um, uh, pinion pines that, thank you, Mary, um, for bringing them. Um, single needle pinion pines. Uh, and they are a very, very rich source of, I mean, we all love pine nuts, most of us do. Um, and the native folks would, um, would gather them seasonally and uh, uh, pound them into cakes, use them in soups. Uh, it, was, it was really fascinating. Um, the more I got into the use of, of um, indigenous people using native foods was how interchangeable some things were. You know, like you could find a particular product and it was used as soups, but then you'd find another product and it was used as soups. And this, this grass was used as bread. Well, this grass was used as bread. And, and it's kind of like, of course, 
because you harvest what's most readily available to you when you can. Um, so, so anyway, the um, pinyon pine is a, a super important food for the um, Sosoni people. The pitch was used for waterproofing baskets as, as the pitch from a lot of the pine trees and the fir trees were. Um, and they also used the, a lot of the pitch for, from um, conifer trees for salves and, and cuts and burns. It seemed to have kind of a universal property that way. Um, lodgepole pine, Lewis and Clark saw um, native folks uh, with these long poles and they gave lodgepole pine the name lodgepole pine. Um, so they were used to, uh, for teepee poles, they were used for um, just general smaller shelters. They were, I, I thought it was really kind of interesting, um, this is a Bannock woman with a, pulling a travois and I don't know if you can see, but in that little basket, there are a couple little kids. Um, so I don't know if they're just so small, or maybe they were tuckered out, or maybe they were, you know, kind of problems or something. I don't know why they were there, but I thought that was a pretty cute little, it's kind of like a baby gate, you know, portable baby gate. Oh, and I should mention, too, that um, the needles of the pine trees, whether it's the lodgepole pine or ponderosa pine, um, they're very high in vitamin C. And so you can make a nice tea out of them. Um, uh, and that's one thing that the native folks did too. Quaking Aspen, Sanabi. Um, I'm not sure, this is a, again another Bannock family. Um, I'm not sure that that's Aspen, um, but it sure does look like Aspen to me, just kind of the long legs and the branches at the top. And, um, but I thought it was a pretty imaginative way to use a sapling. Um, uh, by, by letting those upper branches kind of hold out the top of the teepee. So. And uh, aspen is a member of the poplar family along with cottonwoods and willows, um, some other um, species as well. And all those species um, contain salicin and populin. And both salicin and populin are painkillers and they were the antecedents to aspirin. So native folks would um, uh, uh, peel off the, the coarse outer bark of, of, um, of quaking aspen willows and, and get that inner bark and then they would chew on that and it would be a, a relief pain for them. Also, uh, I thought this was really interesting that the rotten wood of aspen was placed in a, a tiny little breech cloth and was used as a diaper absorbent material for diapers. And I also, um, I was told just as while we were waiting to get started that moth, moss was also used for that as well because it's so absorbent. And the white powder, you know, I, we've heard that it can be a sunscreen, um, but uh, the, the Shoshone people used it as a, they thought it worked for a deodorant, so. So black cottonwood. Um, one of the reasons cottonwood was so important um, was because the wood doesn't smoke very much. So they would use the wood in their teepees and um, where some of the other woods would spark and be real smoky, um, but uh, black cotton wood wouldn't. When there was a really tough winter, they would you pu pull the bark off the trees and use it as a you know, kind of poor nutrition, um, but an essential uh, hay for, for their horses. Um, again, the, the inner bark um, was sweet in the springtime as the sap was rising and they would use that, they would cut little holes and, and take the sap and chew on it. And then I don't know if you've ever um, noticed the, um, when cottonwood is just before it, it leaves out in the spring, it has those gummy little buds on them and they smell heavenly. They get all over your car, they get on your shoes, they're kind of a pain, but they smell wonderful. But they would take those buds mix it with, with animal fat um, and use it as a salve. Um, and uh, in, a, in a, a different cottonwood, but in the Middle East, that was called the balm of Gilead, if you've ever heard of that before. So that was from a cottonwood variety. So, And then um, it was also a, the, a trunk of a cottonwood tree was placed in the center of a sun dance, um, um, I don't know what you call it, ceremonial circle, and it was very important for them that way too. 
This is a beautiful picture, uh, South Fork of the Snake River um, over by High Sea Hot Springs. If you head towards Jackson and you kind of rise up and you see the river down below you, that's where that picture's from. Juniper, Wape. Um, so uh, they use the branches for construction, the berries, um, they use them for teas. Um, uh, they also use them for ornamentation, necklaces, the bark. Um, wildfire goes through juniper pretty quick and uh, the um, indigenous people knew that too and they, they would peel the bark off the trunk and use it as tinder to start their fires. And then the branches and the needles were also used um, for smudging um, along with sagebrush as well. So I'm, I'm talking now mostly about um, native species that were used in construction, um, kind of more practical, useful type of things. But you can see how um, it's like when we think of uh, harvesting or killing a buffalo, that all parts were used you know, by indigenous people. And we can kind of get a sense with this that in many of these plants, all the parts were used. So, so dogwood, um, a beautiful red color. Uh, the, um, they would um, uh, straighten, they would take a relatively thick branch and put it in a form and turn it into a, a bow. The bark was used for smoking. Um, they also ate the food, the white berries, um, as an emergency food resource. Uh, the Sosoni people traveled a lot to follow, follow their resources, um, but they also needed to spend a lot of time next to water um, because we all need water. So um, uh, the reliance on things like cattail, which I'll talk about in a minute, um, reliance on willow, cottonwood, you'll see that over and over again. So um, here is a, a native willow. Um, here are two backrests or chairs. Uh, I'm not sure if the, um, uh, this looks like it's all made out of willow. Um, this may all be made out of willow or these um, red bands could be um, dogwood that they used instead. So I'm not sure which one it is. And then um, again, they used, uh, they used everything. So these are two beautiful um, Shoshone baskets made exclusively from willow. Um, so the, the, the structural part is um, our larger branches and then the, um, the softer uh, woven part, I think, I'm not sure, I think uh, may have been strips of the out, ex, outside bark. But beautiful, beautiful uh, basketry. And again, willow being part of the poplar family, the inner bark was an important painkiller. Golden currant, we're getting into the, the fruits, we're getting into food now. Um, uh, so the, uh, the fruits were eaten just raw. Um, they were also gathered, pounded, oftentimes with the seeds left inside, but pounded so that the seeds um, disintegrated. Um, they could be made into cakes. They were um, mixed with um, ground meat or chopped up meat uh, and fat and other berries um, to form pemmican, which was a kind of like a power bar kind of a um, food. Same with choke cherry. It was important to, uh, for um, pemmican as well. Um, the Shoshone people in the past and continue to make a, a, an important choke cherry pudding um, out of choke cherries. Um, it's, uh, they use it as a food, they, they um, make it uh, during festivals or if they have a big feast and bring, invite people over. Like if you ever go to the Shoban Festival in Blackfoot, um, uh, you may have a chance to have some choke cherry pudding. Um, but there was a young man who heard, he was Shoshone, and he heard that, um, the, uh, that this pudding was, had tremendous healing properties. And so he thought, well, I'm just going to test this out. He heard that it was good for cancers. So he um, created an experiment where he took uterine cancer cells and, and put them on a, some sort of a mixture of chokecherry uh, pudding 
and, and the, it killed the cancer cells. Um, and so there's actually quite a bit of research now on um, how to incorporate the, whatever the active qualities are of, of choke cherry um, for at least that cancer, possibly other cancers as well. Um, elderberry, um, again, the berries were used for pemmican. The, um, they were also used for medicine. Um, the branches were the little bit larger branches. Um, they're kind of pithy on the inside. And so um, they would be hollowed out and turned into like a recorder, the little holes in the top, and they would play them as a flute. In courtship, I understand. All right, sagebrush, sawebe, bohobi. Um, very important plant for ceremony. Um, the, um, the stringy bark uh, was, um, was processed in a way that they could make cordage out of it. Um, I've seen pictures of clothes where, where sort of like a, a, a string frame was created and, and the bark was attached along the frame. So it would be a tear here and a tear here and a tear here. Um, uh, I've also seen sandals made of it as well. Um, they would uh, pull, sagebrush up out of the ground and form a corral and that's how where they would sometimes keep their horses um, and bitterroot was um, not so widely used with the Shoshone people uh, it was a little bit more important farther north in Montana like the bitterroot um, valley area um, but it was still sought after as a early spring food um, the um, it's bitter uh, and the leaves that would be harvested, the leaves would be taken off, um, and then the root would be boiled until the dark outside husk came off. And um, uh, one, re one source I uh, uh, read said that they would split them open and that there was an inner pith that they would take out to make it less bitter. Um, but it was said to be, you know, it was one of the earlier foods that people would eat in the spring that was really fresh and it was highly sought after and, and um, believed to be a tonic. So wild onions, um, just kind of like us, um, Native folks liked onions and um, I have a, a wonderful uh, memory. Um, I lived up in the hills outside of Pocatello and um, I was taking Shoshone. And so whenever you take any kind of language, you learn not only the language, but you learn about the culture. And so we were learning about some of the food sources of the Shoshone and um, onions were mentioned. And I lived up in the hills and where I lived, there were lots of onions. So I dug some onions up and I brought them to Drew, Drusilla, the teacher, Drusilla Gold, and to, as a gift, you know, as a thank you gift, partly, but um, just to share that with her. And her eyes lit up and she said, oh, thank you, she said. I remember when I was a little girl, um, we would hunt marmots. She said they were very good because they just eat the sweet grass, you know. Um, so we would, we would hunt marmots, um, we'd, you know, eviscerate them. Um, and then we would take wild onions and we would braid them. And then we'd put, put them in the cavity, we'd stitch the skin up, and then we place them in a, a ground oven, you know, where you dig a hole and you put some hot rocks there and then some grass over the rocks and they would lay the marmots on the grass and then more grass on top of that, more hot rocks on top of that and leave them for some hours. And she, and her eyes just, you know, lit up. She goes, it was so delicious. <laughs> so, but every time I see wild onions, I kind of think of that. And we have some, some wild onions up here, so you can take a look. So Sego lily, so take a look at the Shoshone word for Sego. Sego, because the, the G is a, a hard, kind of sharp, so it's like a hissy, Sego, Segobi. Um, but that's where we get the name for Sego lily. So um, all parts of it are uh, good. Um, uh, my favorite part is um, when the flowers 
are just about to open. I mean, they're still tight, but they're just about to open. Um, right then, I think, is, is when they're the best. So. And this is a picture. I don't know if you've ever been um, up behind Stanley in the Bear Valley area, but this is acres and acres and acres and acres of seagull lilies. This was, uh, what, two springs ago when we went up there? Took those pictures, I think. And then we see a lot of these guys around along the road shoulders. And you know, probably some of them have hybridized with our um, domestic sunflowers because they like hybridizing. Um, but uh, this is the annual uh, sunflower. Um, and they use the seeds for food. And I, I hope when, when we're through with this part that you'll come up and, and take a look at some of these because the sunflower seeds are about that big. And you kind of wonder how, how they would be you know, harvested in enough quantity and then processed and I understand they were added to soups, they were added to flour, they, uh, to, um, into different kinds of flours to make different kinds of breads. And, um, but folks were really good at that, you know, and I just, I just kind of imagined that, you know, somebody would say, ah, oh, you know, John's mom, she's a really good cook, you know, and she knows how to cook sunflower seeds and mix it with, you know, pemmican and you know, and put in some bitter roots, and oh, it's so good. But I just kind of imagine, just like we admire people for taking, you know, our pantry items and making a fabulous dinner, I can just imagine, you know, indigenous people did exactly the same thing. All right, so some more, um, some more manufacture. Um, so Thule's. Um, I have two leaves down there a little bit, which I got in a little wet area um, near Hagel Park, actually. So they're, they're really common. They're, you find them commonly around um, Silver Creek and, and a lot of the creeks and byways. Not, not quick moving water usually, but they like more brackish water. Um, and it was a very useful uh, reed. Um, it was, um, the Shoshone people didn't do it so much, but some, some peoples uh, where it was very abundant, they would harvest it and then they would make a, a bundle like this and then overlap it with another bundle and overlap it with another bundle and then make one long bundle, wrap that all up and then start all over again. So they would have like six or eight or 10 of these bundles, but then they'd assemble it in a way that would create a boat. And you can see in that lower picture, that's a Thule reed boat. And that's exactly how they construct it. They also use the Thule reeds um, to create duck decoys. And we actually have an example of a Thule reed duck decoy right here um, uh, that somebody just whipped together in a few moments, I'm told. But I think it looks pretty darn cool. Um, and I've also heard that um, you know they would they would make a number of duck decoys. They put them out on the quiet water, and um, they, and some of the real the really good swimmers would take a reed that was hollow and swim under the water while breathing through this reed and come up underneath the living ducks and grab their feet. And that was one of the ways that they hunted ducks. They would bring them in through these two duck uh, duck decoys but then they would come and, you know, and I'm a tender heart, so it's hard for me to kind of hear these stories, but uh, I marvel at the skill and the, just the um, ingenuity. So I mentioned Great Basin Wild Rye. Um, the seeds were used um, as breads, as many grass seeds were, and then the stems, you can kind of see how if you took this, and this is a kind of a small bunch, um, some of them are just enormous, um, how they would make really good thatching. Um, and then moss. I learned from my friend Drew that um, uh, in the Shoshone culture, when a woman was menstruating, they went to the minstrel hut. And it was a very special time. Um, they, they took it as a, a, kind of a kind of a sacred retreat, actually. Um, and people would bring them food. They'd often bring them special foods that they only got when they were in the minstrel hut. Um, but uh, one of the ways that they um, controlled their menstruation was by m making kind of a breech cloth, um, but using moss leaves uh, to absorb the flow. And 
and cattails. Oh my golly, they did so much with cattails. So, um, cattail. So, so we're generally familiar with this brown part. I mean, we, it's really easily recognizable. You just look at it and go, oh, that's cattail. Um, but before they turn brown, they're green. And they're real tightly packed together. And um, uh, so Sony people would harvest those. They would um, put them in one of those oven, or you know, underground ovens and roast them. And then they would eat them like corn on the cob. And apparently they were very nutritious. Um, the seeds, uh, you know how this one's starting to go, but they just kind of go whoof. Um, but they were used in uh, moccasins as insulation, and that just helped keep people just a little bit further away from the cold of the ground. Um, the, uh, the roots, the rhizomes, um, uh, were the kind of the husk was taken off, and um, the root part was cooked and turned into a bread that um, I was told by somebody earlier tonight was just absolutely delicious. So, and then the leaves, um, I can show you some of these things in just, oh, here we are, yeah. Oh, here it is. So here's, here's just part of one cattail. So you can see how puffy they get. Um, and then they also uh, wove uh, mats for sitting on, um, to set things on, um, for sleeping on, so. So those are all the pretty pictures, but I wanted to just bring, share some of the resources that I have really enjoyed and appreciated. Um, uh, Utah State University has a wonderful um, short article on the Native American uses of Utah forest trees. I have a copy of it here. Right here, it goes through, I mean it's Utah, so the trees are basically the same trees. Um, but but uh, they go into quite a bit of detail of the many uses each of these trees um, are used for. And one thing that I really appreciate and which you're seeing more and more of is that this document was reviewed by a Northwestern Shoshone person. Um, so there's, there's been great research before now, you know, with anthropologists, botanists, but it is just so important and it's so respectful to ask the people whose culture you're representing if you're actually representing it correctly. Um, so that was one thing I really enjoyed seeing this. Let's see, and then um, uh, that Native Land Digital with the, you know, all the tribal territories um, North America. And then this is a good website if you're interested in knowing more about Uto Aztecan languages, the history of it, and any other details. Um, I'd also encourage you to, uh, I've talked a lot about the historical uses of um, native plants, um, but many of these same native plants are being used today um, by indigenous people. So they're maintaining, sometimes even re-energizing um, re uses of these native plants. So um, one way you can just find out more about their culture and their life ways is to go to some of these great festivals. And on the first Saturday of June, there's one um, in Fairfield, just hop, skip, and a jump over there, the Camas Lily Festival. And then um, uh, the Shoshone Bannock Indian Festival is always the second week of uh, August. Um, it's in Blackfoot. It's great. The dancing's great. The food's great. They have um, uh, vendors, um, you can kind of go into a back area and watch uh, folks play a traditional hand game, which is like super competitive. Um, and it's just, the dancing is just, it's just wonderful. Um, so I encourage you to go in and enjoy and learn about contemporary uh, Shoshone culture. And then these are some um, books. Uh, the Introduction to the Sosani Language, uh, Daman uh, Degwap, um, by Drusilla Gould and Chris Lothar. Um, I mentioned that. That's this guy right here. Um, and then um, this, is the, what's next? Oh, the um, Smithsonian did a 12 volume of the um, uh, Handbook of North American Indian. This is a handbook. This is volume 11 of the handbook. <laughs> 
Um, but it really has some great information in it. Um, let's see. Um, and then, of course, Tony um, Dugaroniak's um, uh, Evans History of Indians in the Sun Valley area. We have that at the library. Um, here's a, a really nice little uh, helpful book, Montana Native Plants and Early Peoples by Jeff Hart. Um, and then my Bible, which I do not loan to anyone because it may be out of print and you probably can't see this, um, but it's the Plant Communities Ethnoecology in Florida, the Idaho National Engineering Laboratory by uh, uh, professors at Idaho State University. Um, this has, this is just such a gold mine of information. It goes through um, plant species by uh, uh, common and Latin name, the Shoshone, the Bannock names, Shoshone Bannock uses, if, they, if they've been able to understand that, um, where they're found, like was it on Big Southern Butte, was it wherever, and then in this column, um, uh, some of the early researchers that have identified um, these, these plants as food, but it's, it's just a fantastic, uh, fantastic book. And last but not least, where did I put that? This just came out a couple, uh, couple years ago. The Sioux Chef's Indigenous Kitchen um, by Sean Sherman, who is a Ogallala Sioux. He, you'll find cattail recipes in here. You'll find recipes using juniper berry. You'll find recipes using choke cherry. Um, it's Sioux, so it's not Shoshone. I'm talking mostly about Shoshone, but he has a, a, a restaurant in, I think it's Minneapolis, um, that he's had for quite some time. So. Um, the library has this. What's that? Oh. oh. Okay. So someone was just saying that he was here in the valley at the very beginning of his career. So um, let's see. And then um, you may have bumped into these already, but PBS has two extraordinary documentaries. One called Native America, which is a multi-year, multi multi-series, um, uh, multi-year, multi-part series um, that, that looks uh, at a number of different Native American um, communities, uh, looks back historically, but also what, what folks are doing now. I mean, astronauts, nuclear engineers. I mean, just, it, it's, just it's a wonderful, wonderful series. Hip-hop artists. Hip -hop artists, yes, that's right, yeah. Um, I mean, it's, it's really cool. Um, and then the American Buffalo, which is another of the wonderful Ken Burns series. It's just a two-part series. But if you ever wanted to know what really happened, um, that's um, the part one is kind of depressing. And part two just fills your heart because people really step forward to make sure that that magnificent animal did not go extinct. So, and then um, you may be aware that um, the city of Haley has the Haley Native Plant Arboretum. Um, Linda Reese, if you could raise your hand, Linda. Um, she manages that. It's right at the corner of, if you're going up the highway and Fox Acres Road turns off, um, kind of there and then behind the auto parts store, it's one of Haley's best kept secrets. Um, there are 50 native plant species from prickly pear to lodgepole pine to limber pine to mountain mahogany to you know pen stem and so it's been around for over 20 years so you can see native um, idaho plants grown up 20 years so it's a wonderful wonderful resource um, uh, the plants are have these great botanical signs on them um, some of them will give you the shoshone name and shoshone uses um, but it's just it's a fantastic fantastic place And so, last but not least, um, there's this word called Dhamma Sagop. And I learned this in the, my Shoshone class. Um, it sort of is like when we say our world, but when you think of our world, it's kind of, you think of like a globe almost. And it's sort of like, it means like, our environment, but it's not really our environment. Dhamma means our, and sagop means 
it all. So it includes the rivers, the land, the sky, the birds, the insects, the trees. It, it includes me and it includes you in that, those two words, Dhamma Sagop. So I invite you to uh, join me here at the end and say, Zondai Yusungaka. One more time. Zon Dai Yusungaka. Very good. So that's, that's that for that. Um, and then uh, maybe Jim or somebody, if you could turn the, the fluorescent lights on. So we'll have a, a time for some, some questions um, and then, yeah, and then you can just sort of come up. What I've done, I'll, I'll just explain it first because some people may need to run off. What I've tried to do is um, have like a real native plant with, with its parts, its seeds, its leaves, and draw equivalents, so bread. <laughs> so here are some, they're tiny, native onions, cultivated onions, and just some chives I braided together to give you an idea of that idea of seasoning um, the marmot. You know? <laughs> here are some wonderful um, uh, pinion pines, and these are store-bought uh, nets, but they're the same size, so you can kind of see our equivalent. Um, I mentioned choke cherries uh, were good medicine, um, so, and they were used as a kind of pemmican, so sort of nuts and seeds you can't buy like pemmican, so you kind of have to get close to pemmican, so pemmican. Um, did you ever think about wild cherry flavor that that might have something to do with Choke cherries, yeah. So I mentioned that the pine trees um, are high in vitamin C, so they would make a tea or maybe chew on the branches. We just go out and buy vitamin C. And I mentioned that um, the pitch from the tree could be used as a gum. Gum. Um, this is, I'll just turn this around, this is a, Elderberry, it's dry, so it's, but you might recognize the, the fruits there. Um, elderberry cough drops. Um, I mentioned aspen. If you chew aspen and willows, if you take off the outer bark, the inner bark has that salicin and the populin. Aspen. So everything that we have, they have. Here are the tule reeds. Is that Thule duck. We might grab the Neosporin, but Shoshone people and other indigenous people might have grabbed a leaf off of a yarrow for its antiseptic properties. We would probably grab this instead of this, <laughs> us lady people, um, but but you might not. Um, and then I'm sure my dear friend Dahlia is glad that her two-year-old is using this diaper um, instead of softened rotten wood in a breech cloth. And then, oh, we talked about red osier dogwood um, being used as a, as a bow. It's quite springy like that. Um, or maybe decorating the, that backrest that we saw. Um, and we talked about um, juniper being, juniper and sage being used as um, in ceremonial ways to purify the air. I might use some incense. And we didn't talk too much about ornamentation, but these are Thank you, Mary, for bringing them um, with, with colorful beads. But these are 
Um, when you see, uh, you may not be able to see it that far away, but these little blueberries, um, uh, they have a, a, a seed inside and then there's the fleshy part on the outside. Um, and the fleshy part, um, some of the animals eat that. Um, and Mary could probably tell this story better, um, but just the short version of it, Mary's right there, so you can ask her maybe later. Um, but she uh, got this from an Indian man um, whose wife made it, is that? Grandma, Grandma made it. Um, and she waited to harvest the berries after the birds, Squirrel. squirrels and stuff, ate the, the fruit part and left the kind of the seed part and then she would turn them into this beautiful necklace. So you can take a look at that. And then I mentioned the elderberry being used, um, the, the trunk, or sorry, the branch um, with the pith and you could hollow it out um, to make a flute. And this is a, a red cedar flute by Coyote Old Man. Um, don't look like you're gonna be hearing like some great, you know, uh, award-winning flautist here. I'm going to play a couple notes, um, but this is a red cedar flute. See, I told you. <laughs> You're applauding the flute, not my abilities. So um, let's see. Did I get everything over here? I think I did. Okay. Um, so if there are any questions, Mary will bring around a, 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 a microphone um, so that we can be sure to capture your, uh, your question in our AV equipment. So I think uh, maybe there's one right back there. Is it possible for us to go and actually dig up camas root? Is it legal? The question, oh, I guess we all, did everybody over here hear that question? Okay. Um, I, you can buy them. <laughs> yeah. yeah really. I think, uh, really I, right. Um, so just in terms of fresh eating, there was, there was a side conversation that you can buy the bulbs and, and plant them, um, whatever. Um, I, my sense, and there, I know there's some resource professionals here, so please correct me if I'm wrong, um, but my under, I, would not do, I would not go to the Camas Wildlife Refuge and do it. Um, that just seems like the wrong thing to do for me. Um, but I know that some of the little rivulets coming down out of the hillsides, it's BLM land, um, if you can find those areas where they're blooming on a wet spring, um, I, I would think that that is, is okay. You're not going to be digging them to, to sell. You're not going to be, you know, harming the, you know, you're going to be careful when you dig. Um, so it, does anybody have any more specific information about how that might? Yeah, the suggestion was maybe um, calling the land trust. You could also call the BLM. Um, I, there's Camas on the Forest Service, so call the Sawtooth National Forest. Um, but that would be a good, good first step. Good question, yeah, yeah. Any other questions? Uh, yeah, speaking of Camas, is there a false Camas that's poisonous? There's a death Camas. Death. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yep. And they usually grow in very, very different places, um, but death camas is very toxic. And you know, that was one thing that I meant to mention, I have it in my notes, but I forgot to mention it, is you know, I'm speaking about, oh, you can eat this and you can do this and this, but you really have to know what, you, what, you, what you're doing. Um, I could share a, a story about, um, I think it was four boaters that went down the Oahe River some 20 years ago. They were from back east. Um, there's a plant back east called uh, Queen Anne's Lace, I, and I only know that as a name, I don't know anything more about it than that, um, that's edible, and so they're going down the river, and they camped, and they said, the one guy said, oh, I know about this plant, we can eat it, 
And the three other guys were like, ah, I don't know, I don't know. And so he said, I'll show you. And he ate some, and he seemed to be fine. And so another guy said, well, that you know, didn't kill him right away. I'm going to try it. So he tried it. Um, and then the third guy just kind of put it to his lips a little bit. Um, and at that point, the, um, the first guy was, was really reacting. This is it's poison, uh, water hemlock. Um, was really starting to react. So the one guy who didn't take it, you know, climbed up out of the canyon wall and ran some distance until he could get help. And they got a helicopter and they brought it down. Uh, but two of the guys died. Um, one of them was sick, and of course the one guy was fine. But um, so you really, you really do have to know what you're doing. There's some good books out there. There's other, there's knowledgeable people that you can um, uh, talk to as well. So just you know, enjoy that, but just, you know, go with, with, go armed with knowledge and information. Any other questions? Yes. Was corn cultivated in Idaho? Not to my knowledge. Um, I think it was just too dry to do that. Um, there are, I mean, Drusilla told me and she didn't talk very much about this, but she just sort of mentioned um, that the, the feathered serpent, that there were images of the feathered serpent within the Fort Hall area, whether they're petroglyphs or not, I'm not sure. She just kind of alluded to it, and that's very much a, an Aztec um, Incan symbol. Um, so I think there was a lot of trade that way, uh, but I don't, think, I, I don't think it was grown up here. I think as southern Utah, uh, maybe it's a little longer growing season, a little hotter. Um, I've seen little cobs like this, I mean the early corn like this, um, in, in caches that they're just there. Um, so it made it, it made it at least that far. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, Mary. Oops. Hang on, just Did they, um, harvest mushrooms? Like I have, no, I have not read anything about them harvesting mushrooms. That doesn't mean they didn't. I, I just haven't read anything about it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Any other, any other questions? Well, thank you very, very much. I hope you'll take a few minutes to to come up here and take a look at these um, these native plants.